Thanks very much. Sure. Excellent. Do you need anything else? I think we're good to go. <coughs> okay, guys, I think we'll, we'll start. Uh, we've one or two more coming in, so we'll start in what, two more minutes, <laughs> I suppose. So thanks, everybody, for uh, you know coming comment today anyway it's uh this is a third i kind of will start informally this is a third meetup we're still building up the meetup organization and this is the third time it's been over 20 degrees uh, and so every time we have the meetup the temperatures are temperature is always 20 21 22 23 degrees for some reason so we should have them more often i think you know so um uh, or maybe it's just me just kind of sweating <laughs> it may feel a bit hotter than it actually is so, uh, so, so um, this month we have uh, Joe Jaquinta. Uh, he's the author of uh, a number of uh, Alexa books. Uh, so uh, he's our guest speaker today. Uh, so I'll just take it through. The agenda is pretty simple. Uh, Joe will, uh, Joe will, Joe will basically. Uh, so, so we just have the introduction. Joe will, will take up most of the time, actually, all of the time. You know, good hour or whatever. And there's some time for some Q&A at the end. And then there's a raffle. Don't forget to put your names outside on the uh, paper. It's, a pretty, it's pretty crude. I tried to ask them to print out a list and they couldn't. So just put it down and we'll just do a random uh, selection of names. We have uh, some ESP32 modules and uh, some of Joe's books are uh, on offer. So. Um, so that's pretty much it. I think we'll start, Joe. So do you want to go ahead and sure. uh, start? Sure. Let me uh, see if I can... Connect it up. Yep. It likes doing this. Magically work. Sometimes it does. It does. My God. Ah, that was our five minute thing. Alexa, stop. Alexa, stop. Well, now you've had a quick demo of an Alexa device running a timer. That was exciting, wasn't it? Hopefully we'll talk about some more interesting stuff. Um, so, hello. Uh, uh, thank you all for, for having me here tonight. Um, I'm Boston-based, but I happen to be in Ireland. And I said, hey, you know, I'm around. You know, uh, does anybody want to hear about Alexa? And I said, yes. Yeah. So I turned up. It's going to keep doing that. So I turn it off. Uh, so, I'm George Quinta. I lived in Dublin for many, many years, uh, had fun here, uh, but now, I, I, as I said, I'm based in Boston. Uh, but I started working here, I joined a company called Lotus, which I worked with, with Brian here. I don't know if there's, they said they might have some other IBMers here, I don't know if they need to go back as far as Lotus, but um, it was Lotus then. Uh, it's IBM, they got acquired by IBM, and I'm still working for them, even though I've been uh, working stateside for most of that time. Uh, but that's what I do by day. Okay, I'm quite happy to talk about that, but that, that's not, not what I'm here for. Uh, by, by night, um, I do Alexa stuff. Myself and my wife, who's in the back row, who's here with me now, uh, have a small company called Zazazoo. Uh, she does the business side. I do the, the techie side. Uh, and we are exploring uh, commercial options with the Alexa well, voice, voice assistants all together. We have the, the various Amazon products, we have the Google products, and whatever else comes out. And I'll talk about <laughs> the differences of stuff like that. Um, together we have, I, don't know, I, I looked it up the other day, we have 15 or so skills out there in the skill store, which isn't much because there's a whole bunch of skills out there and most of them are pretty low quality. However, we try to focus and we have some actually... I'm going to call this sort of more most complicated skills or the most uh, involved skills. We really try to push the envelope. Uh, our most uh, interesting result is we had one particular skill uh, called which one was that? Six Swords game. Uh, and we had this one guy uh, playing it six hours a day, sitting in front of all these things, talking to it for six hours a day, which was, I was staggered. I didn't think the game was that good. <laughs> that good. I thought it was good, but not six hours a day good. But that was that was pretty good. I would not have thought that a device could captivate somebody like that. So that's what we aim for. We're trying to go for quality stuff like that. But um, and as I said, a lot of it that quality isn't there. Uh, we're happy to see that. We love the concept of comp. We want quality comp competition because that's going to raise the bar for everyone. So we tried to distill some of our 
uh, experiences and stuff, and have done two books today. Um, is this better? I just realized there is a microphone. Is this better? Okay, I'll keep using the microphone. I'm sorry for. So you heard nothing I said so far. Right? <laughs> Okay, yeah, so we, we aim for quality stuff. We had that thing. Uh, we have two books. The first book we published was on um, the general concept of writing apps for Alexa, and also we kept a very general other audio assistants as well. And it's not going to tell you how to write bytes, how to program. Amazon stocks are pretty good about that, so we didn't want to get into that and you know compete with them because we thought they did a good job. and. Anybody can write a begin to program book. There's lots of them out there. That's markets covered. So instead, we focused on design, some development, and also testing. Because people don't really look at those that much, and there's a lot of unique things about these that come into the design and especially the testing side of it. The development is not rocket science. If you can develop, you can develop for these devices. I mean, you're doing IoT stuff, you're well beyond what you need for, for doing these devices. That's not a big problem. Uh, the second book we released much more recently was on writing specifically games for these devices. Um, I know that's not your interest here. I'm not going to go on about it too much. Uh, the reason behind that is Amazon has started to reward the top games on Alexa. They've decided that this is something they want to encourage, so they're doing these monthly payouts now, depending on usage, et cetera, et cetera. That's why some of our more advanced concepts have been in that area, because we get at least some return on our investment there. But that's, the second book is all specifically about games development, but it does cover a lot of the topics that are useful to know for other, other general purpose stuff. Uh, other than that, I spend, used to spend a lot of time on their official forum. Now I spend a whole bunch of time on the Alexa Slack channel, and I got linked to those later. But that's uh, kind of where I interact in this space and, and what I do and what gives me the hubris to, to speak to other people tonight or like that. Uh, I'm not a big IoT guy. Okay, I've not done a lot of IoT stuff. Uh, I know that there's the capabilities of the Alexa, and I knew about them, and I looked into them, read about them, decided that wasn't where we wanted to focus, but I kept up on those sort of things. So I'm going to be a little lighter on the IoT side. I did a lot of research before this talk to make sure I could speak to the audience you know, of interesting things in that regard. So a lot of it will be fairly high level, and you might catch me out on some things, and that's fine. Just say, hey, no. <laughs> and that's fine. You know, I, I, I'm happy to be corrected or whatever. Um, Okay, so let's start, because again, if your focus is IoT, I want to go a little bit into what are these devices. Now, I brought in uh, the range they have here. Well, I'll come to that one. I'll come to that. So a voice assistant is generally, it's a specialized hardware device, okay, that typically sits in a domestic set. Okay, that, that's the market it has evolved. So you have something, that's all it does. It sits there and listens to you. And when it hears what they call the wake word, it's like people get creeped out because I think it's listening all the time, and that would be a creepy thing. And unlike Google watching everything you type, but that's a different story. Um, but it listens for a particular wake word, okay? And when it hears that wake word, and again, on, on the OT side, that's something they do in hardware. Is it listen? Somebody took one of these apart, found out it has enough memory to store about nine seconds of voice data. So it can't really just take everything you say and send it to the internet. So it, it just listens in this little buffer for the wake word, which is usually Alexa. For these devices, it's OK Google or Hey Google for the Google devices, and you can change it to things like uh, Amazon or lately computer. Um, and they wake up. <laughs> That's my daughter's independent gallery. Uh, and when it hears that, it then, oh, OK, now I need to understand. But it hasn't got the brains to understand everything you say. Like I said, it's only got like nine seconds of memory buffer. So at that point, it starts streaming to the internet. Okay, a privacy alert goes off. You're like, oh crap, now it's streaming everything I say. But it lights up this little blue ring. Okay, so Amazon have done a reasonably good job at telegraphing when they're spying on you. Okay, so that's the sort of thing. After that, it's sending everything up to its service and everything after that happens on the cloud. The answers you send up, the answers you come back. So basic idea, we have a hardware device. Okay, I'm sure you've built many devices like this. In fact, there's kits. You can make your own Alexa out of a Raspberry Pi and a, and a download. Okay, and a couple things, a speaker, a microphone, a network card. Boom, you got your own $15 device as opposed to a $150 device. Um, but in general, like I said, it just listens. And when it hears you, it says, oh, okay, it streams up to the internet. You talk to it, it talks back. Almost all the usage model that has evolved is that sort of you initiate the conversation and it comes out. It's like the perfect child, not my child. Perfect child. It speaks when it's spoken to. 
okay? And I think this is a pattern, although you can do it differently, this is a pattern you will tend to see no matter what device comes out for privacy concerns, okay? And everybody wants, you know, what we're calling um, uh, notifications where, you know, it comes up and it says something because you've asked it for something, it takes a little time, it comes back and says something. But the trouble is if it starts saying something and then listening for something, that could happen at any time. Or if you're not there, there's you know, a lot of things like that that... So that sort of style of you talk to it, it talks back. It might continue to listen, and you can say something else and have it come back. Is something you'll probably see in most devices. If you build your own device, think about the good reasons that that is like that. Consider that in your own devices. Um, one of the interesting terms that came out of we were on the um, Google Home beta and got that product early, and something they the phrase they used freely was the you know, eyes free device. Okay, they wanted eyes free applications, and their focus really was on that. You're doing something else, you know, you're looking at your Google stuff and it's busy beaming advertisements into your brain through your eyeballs and you want to do something else. The idea that you can interact with more than one device at a time, that only works if the device doesn't require any sort of visual input. So they're going to talk about eyes free applications. That was a, we derived as their focus. They haven't specifically said it that way, but it makes a lot of sense. And when we design apps, we try to keep to that model, okay? Both Google Home and Alexa can bring up a little extra things on your um, your companion app. And that's nice, it's handy, but we try to keep that out of our core design because we want to keep that eyes-free interaction sort of thing. So again, you can build screens into your own devices and stuff like that. But remember that that's one of the key differentiators about a voice assistant. Okay, so who's in the market? Okay, now everybody's heard of Amazon. That's what I got here. I got the t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> uh, they entered with the Echo, which is the big one over here, uh, and it is still, and it's the most expensive one. This is, I don't know, somewhere around $150. I'm not sure what it is. I think it's about the same in euros. Uh, it has the highest quality speakers and the highest quality microphones, okay? Um, they have since brought out the Tap, which is this. It's a portable version. Uh, it's got a little pad you can charge it on. You can't talk openly to these. You can talk to this. You have to push a button and then initiate a conversation with it. Uh, but it's also a Bluetooth speaker. I think that people they take it outside and use it to play music from their, their phones or something like that. I'm not sure this is done as well. Uh, and then they brought out, most recently, the Dot, which is the little one, which is much cheaper than the Echo. This retails, you needed to get it on sale for about 40 euros or $40, and I think it normally retails around 50. So it's, it's a third the price of this. You can buy them in blister packs for whatever reason. Um, and that's brought the price point around and left a lot of people to experiment with these. They like it. They can now get a couple of them, put one in the bathroom, put one in wherever they want like that. It is a lower quality speaker and a lower quality microphone. We, we don't find this as handy. You know, if we have to shout across the room to it, this one works much better than this one. So it's one of those, it's what you pay for <coughs> goes into the hardware. Uh, Google, Google brought out their Google Home. Google Assistant is the name of the service. Google Home is a piece of hardware. And that kind of fits in here. It's a little cheaper than this. Um, it's a little lower quality than this. You know, if you go to the speaker, the microphone, the recognition, the quality of the voice, it talks about it. So really we found it's kind of you get what you pay for, okay, in, in this spectrum of things. So you bear that in mind if you consider purchasing a device. That's kind of how it works. The interesting thing about Google is they're now rolling out their assistant to every single Android-enabled device. Okay, started with the Pixel. It's now down to, uh, I think, uh, six. Right, and, and I think they're gonna bring it as far as down as five. Okay, which is kind of an interesting way of competing with Amazon, because Amazon is selling these like hotcakes. I mean, every time, I mean, maybe it's just me and customized advertising. Every time I go to Amazon, I go to ads for these things all over the place. I see them everywhere. We get boxes from Amazon, it's printed all over the boxes. So they're really, really, hard selling these devices, because I think they're terrified of Google. But now Google's ha! And every phone, every Android phone, has this on there. So we'll have to see how it plays out. But that's, you know, when you're looking for what is the footprint, that's the sort of thing they like that. Microsoft, they brought out Cortana. Uh, we have been less than impressed. Uh, I think it really only works from Windows 10 now. And that falls out of the specialized hardware device category. So it's now on your PC, but if you're already using your PC, why don't you use a web app? So we're not quite sure that that is going to be successful. <coughs> the fact it works on the Xbox as well is interesting, and that could open doors that we haven't foreseen. 
Uh, Apple have talked about bringing out a HomePod, but they have not talked about making it open. So far, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft are all, all open platforms. You can extend them. Apple, no. Uh, Samsung has Bixby, and they are rumored to be coming out with some sort of hardware device. I'm pretty unclear about what the time frame is on that and whether it will be open or not. It really doesn't happen been enough in getting them out there yet for that. So that's a big question mark. We'll have to see where that one goes. That's kind of the lay of the land as it is now. Uh, but we're going to focus in on Alexa and Amazon. Uh, they are the most established. More, you know, they're, yeah, they're the most established. And look at the stuff. So when they first brought out this device, uh, they were thinking home automation. That was their core. That was their focus. Uh, as I said, I, I've been in IBM for 20 years, but about a year and a half ago, I was thinking of leaving. I happened to interview with Amazon. And uh, that's when I first heard about this. Okay, And I was talking to them in the interview. And they told me about this, and we started going back and forth. And I thought it was a really intriguing idea. And even though I didn't accept the job they offered me, and I ended up staying with IBM, I was so intrigued I started doing this from that point onwards. But one of the intriguing things was that it gave an interface that made home automation, I want to say, possible. Okay? We can, you know, we've always been able to automate things. Okay? That's not an issue. I mean, years and years ago, uh, if you remember Roger Eames, um, manager of my manager, brought me over to his house. Um, I was working in Dublin at the time. I was over in Boston on business. He said, oh, look at this. And he was totally into home automation. He said, watch this. He gets up, goes to the machine, cranks up his PC, launches a program, goes through a couple menus, hits a button, and his curtains open. I'm like, that's great. But you just walked over and opened the curtains. I, I was not impressed, and I had not been and didn't think much about home automation from that point on, because it's just like, that's great, but the interface. Alexa really opened my mind because you have basically a non-hierarchical interface. Okay, Typically, most GUI apps, you start somewhere, you drill down, you drill down, you get to what you want, and then you can do it. Okay, With a voice app, um, I can activate any application that I have installed on it, Okay, which means it's flat. Okay, I can say, you know, open the kitchen drips, and it will do it. I don't have to drill down and stuff like that, you know, unlock the back door or, you know, something like that. Is now we have sort of a one-shot way to get at any of the 40 devices we might have enabled in our home. So it kind of, to me, made me rethink the whole smart home thing, okay? Especially that's important when you look at it from the IoT side of things, because if you're going to have all of these devices and all of them doing sort of thing like that, you need to be able to get to them and specify which one. And that's where a voice assistant can be handy. Okay? Some people have compared it. Now, there are challenges with that. Um, some people have compared the voice interface to the command line interface. <laughs> it's like going back to the days of DOS, the typing is in the command line, in the same sense that you can do anything. You can launch any command you want that your machine has from the command line. Okay? But you have to know which one it is. Okay? They, they, it, you get into all sorts of discoverability issues and stuff like that. It can do anything, but you have to know what it is. So that's, again, why we have a whole book about design, because it's all how do you design these things to be discoverable and, and all that sort of thing. So, boom, boom, boom. That's where Alexa came from. And that was great, but I don't think it sold terribly well, and it had a slower uh, take-up on that. Okay, Because, again, it's like right now they sell these Q lights in America, and that's kind of the entry-level home automated light, and it's like 40 years. It's like, <laughs> I don't know how many people want to spend... 40 bucks in the light bulb, uh, but that's a small market, okay? Similarly, <coughs> they made their interface open. They really encouraged manufacturers to make things that fit into their system, but that's selling hardware. It's not selling software, okay? It has a larger turnaround time. It takes longer to innovate, to come up with the stuff, set up your supply chain. You've got to get China manufacturing them and then get them on boats to come over here to hit the market at the right time. So it's a, it's a much longer lead-in time which has meant that I think the curve was slower than they might have hoped or anticipated. So the non-hardware side of it has kind of taken off. Okay, If you look at you know the early skill market, by the time there were 200 skills there, about 20 of them were home automation skills, and the other were all software stuff. And it's kind of gone up in similar proportion. Actually, the proportion is probably even lower now. There's a lot more home automation skills, but 
there's an even a lot more part of it's because they give away things like hoodies and t-shirts and you'd be amazed how many hours people will spend writing something to get a free t-shirt it's like uh you know <laughs> you know professional prices you don't even get near that or stuff like that and they did that then they started giving away you know dots and everybody went crazy and they started writing like a new hundred thousand new skills a month and it's mostly been that. So all the new growth has been around pure software stuff. Okay. Um, now this again is when, from the IoT perspective. We're going to get to it. Both of those work for IoT. Okay. You don't have to look at it as a home automation thing for it to work on Alexa. You can look at it as a software thing. Both of them work to price up. And I'll go over some of the advantages and disadvantages of each approach in later slides like this. Now. Most recently, they brought out new devices. There's the low price point one with the, with the dot there. Uh, they've also brought out an Echo with a camera on it, which they call the Look. Uh, and you're supposed to be able to like take a selfie and have it comment on your fashion. Uh, I'm not sure this has actually hit the roads yet or not. It sounds like a terrible idea, but you know, who knows? Uh, they've also brought out an Echo with a screen called the. That was the Look. That's the show. Thank you. Um, and that is. It's, it's an Echo, and it's got a screen on it. And, and you know, people are really excited about this. You could do more things with it. Personally, I'm a little dubious. It's like, okay, well, why don't I use a tablet or a PC? That seems like it's a microphone with a screen on it. So I'm not quite sure that they've got a winner there. Right now, in the Alexa circles, it's creating a lot of people are, are excited about that. But I'm not sure that one's going to last a lot. Okay, uh, I was trying to think. Let's do a quick demo. Uh, trying to think what I should do. Uh, Alexa, what time is it? It's 1.55 p.m. She still thinks she's in America. Uh, <laughs> um, very simple thing. Uh, let's see, another one I wrote. Uh, let's see. Uh, Alexa, open Demotivate. Everyone loves you. Just listen to the phone ring. I don't need me to hear that. Alexa, open Demotivate. Who thought that was a good idea? It gives you a demotivation, you know, like the demotivational posters. A lot of people are doing is like, you know, affirmation skills and demotivated skills. So this is a very tri trivial one-shot. Our most popular skill, Alexa, open knock-knock. Knock-knock. Who's there? Alex. Alex who? Just let me in. I'll explain later. So, simple, trivial, throwaway stuff so far. That's about like 95% of the skills that are available out there. They're all these sort of trite, stupid uh, entertainment skills like that. But you don't need to be limited to that. Okay, I'm not going to go too deeply into it, but I mean, you can have much more complicated ones. Let me turn up um, Alexa. Open Six Swords. Welcome to Six Swords. Around you is Plains. The road leads from east to west. More. Around you is Duchy of Green Prairie. Who is with me? Your active companion is Morgan. Your other companions are Melanie, Gus, and Jacob. What At is the end of this message you will hear this short tone. This means that you can say more for additional info. Try it now. What is Melanie carrying? Melanie is carrying sling, small shield, broadsword, and padded armor. You can say inventory Morgan to find out what they are carrying. East. Up we go to the east. You continue through plains. The road goes east and west. You come upon one bison. It rushes you. Say fight to fight the next round of combat or run away to flee. Fight. Jacob misses Bison with his hand axe. Morgan misses Bison with his sling. Melanie misses Bison with her sling. Gus misses Bison with his short bow. And then hits for four damage. Bison misses Gus. You have one enemy left. Quit. That's enough. Fun. But that's much more complex than the other ones. Okay, if you played any sort of text and adventure game, it kind of like probably rings some bells. But you can see it's like, okay, well, we've got several levels of information that can be conveyed there. 
lots of different actions that can take place. There's a landscape you can go across. You know, it, it's it's there's a lot there. Yeah. Lost my person. Um. So. You're not limited to any small trite skills, okay? There is a bunch of different places you can go. A bunch of different places you can go with this. So bear that in mind as we go through this. But as a quick demo, as you can see, though, it's all, you talk to it, it talks back. You talk to it, it talks back. Uh, you can see a little bit of the discovery features, a little beep at the end that explains, is like, oh, you hear this, you can say more for more info. Um, there's a lot of compression to this. So when we look at the Internet of Things, Okay, and you want to interface that with this. I'm sure your minds are filled with different ideas about, oh, could you can do this, and wouldn't it be cool to do this? And there, there's there's tons of stuff that you can do. Now, when we drill down specifically to Amazon and to the Alexa service, I want to go through some of the choices you make when you're doing it. Okay, first choice is whether you're gonna just, you just want to do something for yourself. Okay, I want my curtains to open, or whether you want to do something that I'm selling a curtain opener motor, and I want everybody to be able to use it. Okay. Second choice is more technical. It's like there's one way you can implement a skill called a smart home skill. There's another way that's called a custom skill. And there's good ones for ones and ones for the other. So we're going to look at some of those. But first, I want to look at the, the architecture that Amazon has for these things. Okay? So you kind of understand what it's like. I assume you guys know a bit about networks and you know how, how things communicate and web services and stuff like this. Um, if you're like playing with Raspberry Pis on, on boards, you know, you probably know how that stuff works. So the way Amazon is set up is you talk to, you would think that this device would talk to your hardware devices in your house. It doesn't. Okay. There's all sorts of interesting, you know, privacy issues and stuff like that, and you know, be fertile thing for hackers. So that actually doesn't happen. What happens is when you talk to it, like I said, it first listens until it hears Alexa, then it wakes up and starts streaming to the internet. So what happens is everything it hears goes up into Amazon's Alexa service. It's a big service that filters out. It's like, oh, am I talking to something we know how to do, like playing music? Am I talking to this? Or am I talking to an individual's skill that they have deployed for? It? They call their apps skills. Uh, in that case, it then roots. It does all of the speech-to-text stuff. Okay, You never have to deal with audio files. In fact, you cannot get audio files. It's, again, a privacy thing. They won't give you that, but they'll give you the string text for custom skills, for smart home skills, actually. They work out, did they say turn on the light, did they say turn off the light? But ultimately, they end up calling you. This is where you live. Okay, actually, you live down here, too. But, you know, everything down So they call you, your service, up in the cloud. You have to deploy your endpoint up in the cloud. And that gets the things like say, oh, by the way, they want you to turn on the light switch that has been named kitchen that is, belongs to, that you manage. And here's their user ID. So from that... You have to have forged the relationship down to that device. Okay, and we'll get a little more specifics of that. But the idea is that this is then your, your enabled device. This has to talk to your service to know which one it is and make that connection. And, oh, this is this device. It belongs to this person, et cetera, et cetera, like that. And we're going to connect them together here so that when somebody says something, it goes to the cloud, it works out, it's you that manage it. You get told to do something with it. It's up to you to work out how to get down to that device and ask it to do that. Okay. With me on that? One person with me. <laughs> All right. People confused by that. Try go through it again slower. Different language. Non-American. Um, okay. Bear that in mind, because that affects how and what some of the sort of things you choose. But that's where things... There's a lot of the cloud in here. I think it's Amazon, AWS, all that sort of stuff. They want to cross all their cloud stuff. Okay, so as I said, the first choice was that something is a personal skill just for you to use, or something is a, a commercial skill, professional skill, whatever way you want to look at this. Now, if you're doing a personal skill, the idea is like, I want to enable this for my use. And a lot of people, a lot of people I've seen in the forum who like to play with IoT stuff, they want to get their stuff working. It's like my good friend Travis, he wants to be, he's sitting there working away on his 3D printer, and he wants to watch YouTube on his show, and he wants to get do stuff and then you'll get it to play the music for him and things like that, or just his own particular stuff and his own particular thing. Um, and that's fine. Okay, there's a lot of stuff, and it's a great way to, to innovate. Okay, to start off with this, it's like, okay, let's see if I can get something cool going. Can I make this work? Is it do I find it useful? 
And if you decide that, yes, I find it useful, then you can think about growing it into something <coughs> that can work for a lot more people. So to do that, as I said, you remember the sort of part, it's like you got to get into your network. So the first thing is your device has to talk to your cloud service. Okay? If it's your thing, say, okay, everybody's got a firewall on their router. I would hope everybody these days has a firewall on their router, which incidentally is actually my day job. And I have this firewall's on very big routers. Um, open a hole in it so we can talk to back and forth, et cetera, et cetera, like this. Then it's like, oh, my cloud service has to know about this. Well, you know, if you know your IP address, you tell your IP address it's got it. And they can, you know, again, go either way um, and do the stuff to get that communication going at this level here. Yeah. Between Amazon, Alexa, and your service, that's done already. That's just, you know, cloud talking to cloud, that's easy. But this bit here, you can hardware, you can hard code to be your network, everything's open, everything knows about the stuff. So the architecture is pretty simple, okay? you just like, okay, I'm going to open everything and I'm going to point the stuff at the stuff, you're good to go. Um, that's one of the big benefits of this. You don't have to mess with, as we'll see, when we get to commercial skill, all the crazy stuff you have to do. Uh, discovery is easy. If you have a couple of machines, if you have another machine there, um, you just need to tell your service about it and now it knows about it. <coughs> when Amazon asks you, hey, what devices have you got installed, you just you can answer right out of your, you know, your code lookup table or something like that. So that's all pretty trivial, okay. And disadvantage, you have to change your code every time you change something, but you know, if you're doing iterative development, you, you're going to be doing that anyways, okay. You're, you're, you're brainstorming, you're coming up with, does this work, et cetera, et cetera, like that. So this is, if you're messing around, you want to learn something, this is definitely the route you want to go, okay. Do something, don't be afraid of hard coding at the start off. Make sure your concept is going to work. Okay, there's some things that you think, wow, this will be really useful. And then you try it out and say, like, oh, actually, it's, you know, it would be easier to go up and talk to it. It's good at recognizing some things. It's not good at recognizing other things. Sometimes you just have to try to see what's going to work, what's going to be useful. <coughs> so the flip side of this is doing a commercial scale. <coughs> okay, you know, if you're going to deploy this to a whole bunch of end users, okay, you can't just put a hole in their firewall. <laughs> you can't say, oh, by the way, Go to your router because they don't know how to. They probably don't even know their router has a firewall. Okay, <laughs> you can't do it that way. So you have to manage that. Okay, a lot of hardware devices uh, manufacturers write their own little hub that you run on your local network. So oh, you must have a PC in your home, and you must install this piece of our software. And it knows how to look on your Wi-Fi to find the other hardware devices, so it knows them all now, and it connects with the website of the stuff there. You're going to have to do that for your stuff. So if you want to make something that uh, is going to be sold, you have to also include that sort of part of it. Um, do you have a hub on the land? That's one way of doing it. It's not that you've got a hub. You've got your own software that runs on their land, looks for the devices, and then you need to establish the communication between the two. Okay. Personal skill, you can just open a hole in the firewall. You know the IP address. You can go back and forth. That's not going to work in a commercial setting. Because uh, the users it has to be as hands off as possible. So one thing users do not know about is network setup. If you have, to, if they require to know a certain amount of network setup, it's never going to be used by people. So you need to make it seamless. You need to make it turnkey, which means you have to have self discovery. How you communicate to the two between the two, you can use like a reverse proxy. So your LAN communicates to the cloud and kind of leaves that open, so that the cloud can talk to the LAN whenever it wants. Because remember, everything's initiated in the echo. It has to come back down and be able to communicate to the LAN in the person's house whenever it wants. So if you can't, boom, just pull, ping it, it's got to like have either like a reverse proxy or it has to pull it frequently to say, have you got something new for me, et cetera, et cetera, like that. I have seen some phones where you can actually get the firewall to open a hole. I don't know how that works, so I can't speak a lot. I don't know how hard or easy that is. Uh, the other way is instead of having a piece of software that runs in their house, you can put it on your hardware piece. Okay. It's not... You know, huge, I mean, if you've got a device, there's only one of which they're ever going to have, that simplifies your thing a lot, okay? You don't have to be able to have the device discovery and things like that. You can just have the one piece of hardware. That might be a circumstance where you actually just want to put the whole land side software on the piece of hardware, make it completely turnkey, so the user never actually has to interface it. It can be smart enough to then talk out to a well-known IP address that you have that your cloud service is on. Now, of course, if you do that, you need more, your hardware needs to have a higher power in it. I mean, if you're doing a little 
uh, card-based device, you're going to have a, a bigger CPU on it, it's going to be on longer, you're really not going to be able to make it battery-powered or whatever else like that. You have to build that into your design. You can have more software running on it because it has to do this management and connectivity back up and down the line. That's part of it. The other part about it is the whole device user relationship. It's like you're not in the hardware to know. You're not in the hardware business anymore. Okay, you're making a device and you're selling it to people. If you got the hardware, it runs there. You have to have the whole website of it as well because they're going to buy this piece of hardware. They're going to put it on there. They're going to connect it up. But in order to connect their Alexa to that, you have to forge that identity relationship. If you remember, Alexa knows who you are, okay? But it has to be able to tell your service who you are. So it knows which one of these connected devices is you. So at some point, the user's going to have to log on to your web app or somehow establish with it who it is and authenticate with it. Because Alexa uses the OAuth 2 authentication thing, and that's how it communicates from its service to your web service, okay? So you need to use that sort of thing to establish the identity of the user so that you know which ID when Alexa <laughs> talks to you, they can tell you who's actually requesting this and then you know whose land to go to to flip the lights on or off or something like that. So that's a big part of the puzzle and you need something that's customer facing, okay? So again, you're just like building hardware devices, now you have this whole other thing you have to create a whole web app that manages that part of the relationship. So, you know, as I said, then the top half there, that's, you get to, that's why that you need this, you know, talking back and forth, but you need then they can so go on and sign up for your site and identify themselves if they add additional devices, you give them a way to add devices and all that fun stuff, et cetera, et cetera. You need support because they're going to get it wrong and you want to talk to somebody and it's going to not work sometimes. And, one of the very irritating things is that often Amazon can have a problem, but you end up front-ending it because the user's trying to use your device, is trying to use your application, they think you're at fault when it's Amazon's at fault and you have to let you get the bad reviews. You get the, you know, you're the first line of defense, so often that comes to you. So you need support. So going commercial is kind of a big step, okay? Um, it's a new field. There's a lot to be done there. I don't want to discourage anybody, but don't forget to factor that part in. Okay, it's, it's, it's more than coming with a cool sort of thing. And another reason that you might want to just stay doing it the personal school like that. So that's one choice, personal or commercial. It's kind of a big step between the two. Uh, but now we can jump into the whole technical side of things. So you've got this other choice between a smart home skill and a custom skill. This is Amazon terminology. I'm going to kind of walk through what a little bit of that means. As I said, when they first came out with Alexa, they, their vision was mostly home automation. And they had, oh, we also have these custom skills. And if you really want to make a, you know, a software-only solution, you can do that. You know, but that's what kind of ended up taking up. But they had this smart home API. And what they tried to do there was build it in so that it could be easier to integrate stuff. And that big diagram of all the conversations going back and forth is their idea of easy. Uh, that's what they got. But on the API side, they have things to say, oh, tell me what devices you've discovered. Okay, they have an API calls your service and expects your service to be able to understand that and to respond, okay, here's what I've got. Okay. Instead of having a conversation, there is a sort of like, okay, tell me what you've got. Okay, now I know the realm of what you have. What features does that device have? Okay, can you set the temperature on it? You know, does it have a color setting? Okay, is it a lock that you can turn on and off? You know, it doesn't have a camera on it. It has that sort of hardware sort of query to understand really what this device does. So it's a lot closer and a lot more focused on sort of attaching hardware devices to your network. Okay. Um, state query. Is it on? Is it off? Is it locked? Is it unlocked? What is the current temperature? State activation. Do this to it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They also have this ability with um, activities and scenes, which I've only read a little bit about, but the idea there is that you can group things together. It's kind of like a macro ability in the sense that, oh, well, I want to do blah, which involves, you know, turning on the light switches, you know, putting the record player on to romantic music and turning the lights to, like, you know, rose red for you. It's like, you know, date night or whatever like that. So, but they, you know, have different, you are like, okay, I'm going to bed. It's like, I'd use, what I use my Alexa for is like, you know, start playing songs for my children, you know, we turn the lights out, and we set the sleep time. 
that sort of thing. But you can sort of group those together. You can only do that with smart home skills. Uh, the other big advantage <coughs> is direct invocation. Okay, Alexa understands them implicitly. Like if you notice there, when I launched on one of my skills, I had to say Alexa open, blah, 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 Alexa play, blah, blah, blah. You had to invoke the name of your skill to get it to actually do something. With the home skill thing, once it understands, and you, it recognizes, uses the discovery to find out what your devices are, it lets the user name those different devices, okay? Usually with some sort of location involved as well. And then it can refer, and it knows what type of device it is. This is a light switch. You can say, like, Alexa, turn on kitchen lights, and it will do it, okay? It doesn't have to know the mix between color and temperature. That you can set something to a certain percentage, okay? Um, <coughs> it understands locks, it understands things can be on and off. So, in, in my programming mind, it's like, oh, it understands analog values and Boolean values, and, and that's about it. Anything more complex than that, it doesn't understand. If you've got a device that has, like, three Booleans on it, it doesn't understand that it would have to understand as three separate devices, okay? And that makes a lot of kind of more interesting things. You just, it, you just can't do that easily with it. You lose some of those benefits of the direct invocation and stuff like that. Um, although, maybe with these new activities and stuff, that could um, actually get around it. Um, the other thing there is if you come up with a new concept, you can't deploy it until they support that sort of thing. Okay, so you want to, you know, um, you know, when you can let the pet out or something, like a cat door open the cat door. It's kind of an open close, and you might actually do that, or lock and lock. You want kind of a different phraseology makes sense for your new innovation. You have to wait until Amazon have built that support in for the home skill stuff. They're not extendable. You're stuck with their terminology, okay, and their types of interaction stuff there like that. So that's something to bear in mind. If you want to push the envelope, it's a little harder because there's times you just have to wait for Amazon, and Amazon won't tell you what they're doing. They're, they're very closed-mouthed about their roadmap. You know, I, I've used dental pliers to try to get information out of them without a lot of success. It's just been crazy. Uh, the other thing is you can't chase the phrasing. You know, you've got on and off. You've got open and close. You know, like if Alexa, release the Kraken. But you can't do that because they don't understand what release means. You can call your device the Kraken, and that's fine. But it's like, Alexa, turn on the Kraken, or turn it off, or lock it, or unlock it. You can't change the terminology. So that's something to bear in mind. It can affect how the user interacts with your device. So the alternative is a custom skin. Okay, and this is their idea, like, oh, this is going to be a grab bag. You can do whatever you want. It's kind of a, a, a speech-to-text interface. So, yeah, speech-to-text interface. And then you can do whatever you want on the back end. Now, that's a big advantage. You can do anything you want. You can put any sort of interface on it you like. You saw my little six sword games there. I can talk to it and I can direct a team of people on doing something, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, like that. Um, if it could do that, you know, it can you know manage any sort of thing at all like that. Now complete control of um, if you imagine instead of you know controlling a team of adventurers going around slaughtering you know helpless monsters and grabbing their treasure, you were you know commanding a fleet of IoT devices, you know, in, in a chemical lab or you know of, of, you know, a bunch of drones, you know, covering a sporting event or something like Whatever your IoT thing is, if it's, you know, broad like that, and you want a different language to do that, you could do that with this, okay? You're not limited to turning things on and turning things off, okay? If you want to do a mixed mode thing, where not, are you, not are you, only are you just using this to activate a hardware device, it's like, I want to do this with the device, I want to do that with the device, it's like, well, there's also services. It's like, okay, well, you know, if the temperature is this, then do this, or that you want the person through the same interface to interact with your website to, oh, buy more minutes for, you know, buy, you know, Hulu or something like that, and then, okay, turn the TV on. So, oh, you're out of minutes. And you can do that as well. You're not just limited to hardware devices through the same interface. You can do all the software stuff that you would be, that the custom skills were kind of designed for. So you can make those sort of multi-modal sort of things. And the fact that you can do anything means that you can innovate as much as you want. If you want to do something, actually, you want to change your terminology, you can do that. If you think you got a better way, put it in there, add the phrasing to it, it can understand it. Now, some of the disadvantages of custom stills is you can do anything. Um, it's often if you, you know, I make this mistake all the time when I design software systems, like, let's add a macro language. Now the users can do anything, but they don't know what to do then because you haven't sort of handed this stuff to them. So it can often be a sort of like, well, with the home skills API, it's like, okay, well, here's you know, here's how discovery works. 
here's how activation works, here's how state works. It's very well defined. If you've got a custom skill and you can do anything, it's like, well, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. You have to kind of not boil the ocean. You know, you want to, you want to pick your subset of that, and you have to have that sort of discipline. Another disadvantage is you no longer have direct invocation. You can't just say, you know, Alexa, release the Kraken. You have to say, Alexa, ask WizBay Manager to release the Kraken. As you saw there, you have to invoke the skill. A lot of mine, I just invoke it, and then you go into an interactive mode and talk with it. Other ones, you can do the one-shot invocation, but you have to add it all together on the, the command line. The, um, the Alexa, in your verb, name of your skill, and then some sort of preposition, and then another command. And that can, your skill will be invoked with that additional command. Okay. Um, did I do it? Oh, this next slide or not? So you have to do. That's a little more hard for users to manage. Okay, it's not quite as seamless as the other thing, but it is the power. And again, if you if they say something is not quite right, you can ask them. Okay, I didn't quite get that. Did you mean to do A or B? And, and let them then further on and clarify that and say A or B. Or if they need more information, like say they haven't named your device, because now you're in the realm that you have to do all of that. You have to do your device discovery. You have to do the device identification and say, okay, well, I see that you've got three fish tanks attached. Um, I'm going to blink the lights in fish tank one. What do you want to call that? Or you know something like that. You have to do that mapping. That is already done on the home skills API. So you have more choices to make with custom skills, but you have more freedom. Okay, so that's your sort of second level of choices. You make. So you made your choices, you've written your skill, you've got it working to your satisfaction. What comes after that? If it's for personal use, you're done. You, know, you can do what you want. It doesn't matter because you're using it, you're happy with it, you're done. If it's something you want to get out to any other person, one thing to look at is certification. Okay, Amazon won't put it up publicly until you have gone through the painful, irritating process of certification. Uh, this is their way of making sure that you have followed the guidelines that they've published. And their guidelines are not always the clearest, and the people trying to test them are not always the most consistent. So there can be a lot of irritating back and forth, or rather not back and forth, because you post it for certification, they throw it back to you. You to post it again for certification, and somebody else gets it. <laughs> it's not a conversation; it's a sort of back and forth. And you know, if you're trying, if you're doing something straight out of a template, it's no problem. They're familiar with that; they're good with that. If you're trying to be innovative and push the envelope, as we often do, it can be kind of tedious. But once you've done, you're done, and your skill is live. And also, the only thing they really lock down is the audio interface. Okay, that here's what you can say. Here's what you can hear. What can be said back? You can change that anytime you want. It's a web service. It's up there on the web. They don't force you. They, they can't tell when you change your web service. So you can continue to do stuff. And a lot of the techniques we'll use is we'll register and get certified the broadest possible audio interface. And then once that's solidified, we'll then add as many features as we can over time behind that. So we get to the point that we really need to, for the user to be able to say something else. This is where yes and no become very handy. It's like, always make sure you can understand if a custom skill, yes and no, because you can do a whole lot <laughs> <laughs> with just that and completely change your skill. Uh, the other side is business development. I mean, if you're putting your time and energy into this, most people are going to want some sort of return, more, more than a t-shirt, more than a free dot. Okay? <laughs> you know, if you're a professional and you're putting professional time into it, you're going to want to have some payback. Now, on the good side, if you're selling hardware, that's a lot easier because you have a sales channel. You are selling a device. Okay? And... That is going to be how you make your money. The whole software side of it is just an adjunct to make it useful to people to make them want to buy that. Okay, um, It's harder if you're just going to be on the softer side of things or you're trying to sell enablement for something that a lot of people already have. Okay, Or, hey, go buy this. Here's a kit you can put it together for yourself. And now you want them to use your software to use that. Making money there is much harder. Amazon didn't really think this through at the start. They, they're selling hardware. Okay, so the people who invented this make their money selling hardware. Their first idea was home automation. Oh, these people are selling hardware, they're going to make that money that way. But most people now are writing software for this. And it's kind of hard. Okay, uh, it's, it's, it's been a continuous back and forth with Amazon about return on investment. It's like, how, how are we supposed to make money doing this? I'm putting all this time into it. I want, I want to see some money. I, don't, I just don't want, I can't live on t-shirts. You know, my daughters love it, but I'm not going to send them to college based on free t-shirts. Uh, they have this little game payout, like I said now, but it's you know it's nice to get something, but it's not a professional wage. 
Um, that's a big question. That's something you really want to think through and ask yourself, why am I getting involved with it? What do I see as the direction we're going? If you do go in that direction, trying to get a biz dev contact on Amazon is a good step. Okay, It's somebody you can talk to, you can go back and forth with, you say, okay, this is what I'm trying to do. And if you can get them interested in you, that can go a long way to getting some tidbits of information or some bits of help out of them. Okay, It's not by a long shot... Um, a real estate equanimous business partner relationship. I mean, that, that's what I did in Thriving a long time was business partner technical enablement, okay, to help our business partners make money. They, they're not really there. They, they, they don't see it as that sort of service. It's really domestic services is kind of been an add-on, mostly done by amateur. So their business side, they don't have a lot of sway inside of the invisible Alexa department. But it's something, okay? If you can't get a business contact, because sometimes that's a little hard to nail down, there are a number of very public developer evangelists. Uh, there's one in Dublin, I think on the 23rd, he's talking to some other meetup group. Uh, I think there's an Alexa-based meetup group or whatever. And he and I have done stuff together, and I was really annoyed. We're actually going to be in the same country at the same time, and we're going to be different. I'm off to carry it for another two weeks after this, so it's out on that. Um, but they're very open. You can make contact with them. There's a number of them. Uh, you can find a list on Amazon. I'm happy to give my opinion on, on several of them. That's David Abitsky. He's really good. He's the one that's been around the longest. He's a great person to, to talk to, and he'll try to do his best for you. They, again, don't have a lot of sway inside of the Alexa group, but they're good like that. Um, really, if you're going to be doing business development, think about how you're going to get to customers. Okay, The best way is that these little scrolling ads that come up on the Alexa device, on, well, not on the device, on the um, their app, both the web app and the mobile app, but they're very hard to get onto. Amazon have a really tight control over that because they're very concerned, and Google as well, about how people perceive their device. So they've been pretty locked down on those things, and they're very hard to get onto. So really think about, can I do my own advertising channel? Um, make a Facebook group early, try to get people onto that, because you can then advertise to those people who are in your uh, Facebook group or whatever way you're gonna communicate. Try to keep that in mind and a way to keep your customers there, okay? Because that will be essential to promoting your thing. Don't think that you can rely on Amazon because that they have their agenda where they want to go, and it's sometimes hard to persuade them of what you're trying to do there. So, um, that's a lot about how you can do stuff. Okay, some of the, the pitfalls on that, I just want to talk, uh, as we're near, nearly at the end, um, about what to think about. And again, these are my crazy thoughts about uh, the Internet of Things. Okay, you guys probably have much better thoughts there, but looking at it from an Alexa perspective, um, the most focus has been on home network and home automation. Like I said, this is a consumer product. It's usually deployed in a domestic <laughs> setting. That's kind of been Amazon's vision. But don't let that be blinders to you. Okay? You, you can innovate past that. It's like, okay, well, you know, we had somebody trying to put these in hotel rooms, okay, as a concierge sort of service. When you're looking at the Internet of Things, it's like you can wire this into anything. It doesn't have to be a domestic setting. It could be a commercial setting. It could be a retail setting. And there, there's lots of opportunities there. Don't let Amazon's choice of direction channel your choice of innovation. Okay? You know, broader infrastructure is a lot for broader application. You're going to put it somewhere else. You know, maybe it's like in, in theaters like this. If, I could, if we could have uh, turned the lights on by asking for it, it would have saved us like 10 minutes stumbling around in the dark when we came in here. <laughs> it's, you know, that sort of thing. You know, think about that. Um, most of the sort of IoT stuff I've seen in the home monitor stations I've seen is command and controls. Like turn this on, set the temperature to this. What you know is you know, is the door locked? That sort of thing like that. But especially if you have to, thinking you have to go in a custom skill direction, think about more broadly. Okay, not just and again if you start looking at sort of industrial and commercial settings. IoT stuff is not being used to turn lights on and off. It's, it's being used for inventory tracking. It's being used for all sorts of crazy stuff. When you get into the voice enablement, you have the opportunity to go beyond just physically doing things to the devices. But what I was suggesting here is status and monitoring. It's like, okay, you know, what is the inventory level? Or you know, how is the inventory moving? Okay, getting quick feedback reports on your fleet of IoT devices. Okay, it doesn't have to be, what I'm saying is think beyond the one-to-one -one relationship. 
you know, controlling a certain sort of thing like that. It's like, what's this current power consumption in, you know, my building? Okay, you know, read that little device back. Say, okay, well, turn off the lights over here. You know, some of these are better served as like a web application or something like that. But there are circumstances where it might make more sense to use, you know, an audio device. Again, think back to that sort of eyes-free application. Okay, are there circumstances where somebody is doing something else and they're, they're watching security cameras, okay, and they need to keep their eyes on that, but they want to check the status of something or something like else. That's where a voice thing can be useful. Um, think about groups of devices instead of a simple device like that. Uh, one thing they are coming out with, which isn't quite a game changer, but it does add a new texture to the field, is, as I said, they speak when they're spoken to. Okay. A lot of people want them to be able to wake up and say stuff. They can't do that. A lot of people have played with IoT devices where you speak to it, and then later the device speaks to you because they want that notification stuff back. They are adding a notification API where a skill can later asynchronously send back a message to it. But it won't wake up and say, instead, the little ring goes green. And you have to say, Alexa, what's my message? And then it, it plays the message to you. Now, that's much more limited than what a lot of people want, but it's much more elegant if you consider privacy important, okay, in the sense that it's not broadcasting ad hoc for anybody to hear a sensitive piece of information. You have to see that. You then have to respond to it. It's, I think, as far as they're going to go as sort of notification stuff. But it is there. It is going to have some. It's in beta right now. Uh, they won't say when it's going to be released, but I've, I've seen it. I know people who've used it on the beta. That's kind of how it works. There might be things that that can be used for. Think, you know, at least that little bit into the future. Um, I would recommend not to be too distracted by something like the Echo with the screen. I'm a little skeptical about that. I think the pure audio devices is where the best value lies, okay? Um, in the sense that an eyes free thing, you're, it's something that is different. When you start adding a screen to it, 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 it starts being a lot like this, you know, or it starts being a lot like this. So when you think of your ideas and your application, you need to ask yourself, are users going to you know, is this a good solution for that, or should they be using, you know, a, a PC or a tablet or a phone? Is that really a better solution? Does this give them an advantage? Well, as I said, think of circumstances where they're going to have their eyes doing something else, and they want to invoke your device or something like that, and that is a good sweet spot. So that's that's about it. There's just some places you can go for more information. You, you can find me there at all. Uh, I have no idea how much of my time I've used up, probably way too much. Um, 7.30, actually, no. Is that, is that good? Is that good? <laughs> so, uh, I do normally like taking questions as we go, but it, it seemed the easiest here just to go through it all like this. Uh, I did some of that a little fast. I know some of it may not be in your kind of sweet spot. So, now, so just tell me your ideas. Ask me direct questions. You know, we can make this a, a question and answer. We can have discussions about it. I mean, what do you think? Is there anything that you want me to explain again because I went through it too quickly or it was fuzzy? Someone has to be for Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering. I'm sorry, I wasn't here for the first half of an hour, so if you already touched on that, you know, it's a, but what would you uh, take, uh, what would be the comparison that you could make between the Google Home type of a device and Alexa device? Do you have a comparison that you did yourself and experience with that? Okay, Google Home versus Alexa. I, we've used both. We're on the beta for Google Home, so they're at the beginning. We got a lot of stuff. They are similar enough that we write code that works on both. Okay? And our cross platform, we created our own cross platform library, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. <coughs> And there's about a 90% overlap. Okay, we've done this specifically so we code to the 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 union of this. We we code to the totality of their features, and some of those features go for Alexa, some of those features go for Home. Uh, and you have to make that when you design so that you don't design this as a critical thing. It doesn't work on that device. But there's about a 90% overlap, so they're very similar. Alexa is a little more mature, so it's a little easier to work with their setup, Google's still kind of like, they call it one thing over here, they call it one thing over here, and it's like three different websites to get this stuff going. They don't have a good way to roll out stuff as data, so it's, it's a little, right now it's a little more tedious to develop for home. So we typically get it all working on Alexa, and then work on deploying it to home, and we usually find that there's not a lot extra to do there. They have a few extra features, mostly to do with making it good for mobile devices, <coughs> and some of them really improve the usability. 
Okay, and that, that's really cool. And Alexa's only kind of catching up on their show device. So that's sort of a good thing there. But you need to see what your target audience is and who they mostly are. And there are a lot more Alexa devices out there. But then if you consider phones to be a device that he's going to use, it can tilt towards Google. But it's not a lot of work to make it work on both. Again, if you're just kicking something off for your personal use, pick one of them, go with that. Uh, if you want to start commercial use, don't lock yourself into one platform, okay? Because you know, you're really not clear how they're going to go. And again, I think Alexa's or Amazon's motive, their core motive in all of this, is to sell more things in the marketplace. Okay? I think Google's core motive is to advertise more things. Okay? This is what they make their money on. This is what they do. And now we're going to start seeing advertising in the voice interface and stuff like that. So. That starts to pull them in slightly different directions. Okay, Amazon doesn't necessarily care as so much as third-party things unless there's marketplace tie-ins. Okay, Google wants you to write interesting things so lots of people use it, which gives them more surfaces to advertise. Okay, so I think we're going to see them going different ways. I still think there's going to be an awful lot of overlap, and it's wise to, to play to both. But I think we're going to still yet see how that plays out. Do you see any clear advantages from the synergy that Google may have with their voice recognition that they use on the phones? It's like both systems use cloud for your voice uh, recognition and contextual awareness. Okay, do I see synergy between how you, Google is using their voice recognition? <laughs> Are they better than Amazon because of those synergies? With the maybe, yeah, okay, maybe you should take it a different direction. Now, I used to work back in the day on machine translation. Okay, and there's a very number of similar things going on there. In machine translation, one of the key things is that the narrower, narrow, more narrow your vocabulary, the more accurate the results work. Okay, so Amazon, you have to have this very stringent audio interface model. It's part of the certification thing. So they very much have gone in that direction. Okay, in the sense that they, so they can constrain and know exactly what your vocabulary is. Because quality is king. You want the highest quality recognition. So they've constrained the vocabulary to drive that high quality, okay? which is good. I, I like that as a direction. Now, Google kind of threw me there because when you're on the beta, I'm saying, okay, well, there's this something. I say, oh, no, we, we don't do that. There. So, back a step. So on Alexa, it goes from speech to a series of phonemes, okay? You know, the different parts of the speech, the different tones, straight to what your vocabulary is. Okay, because you do this thing and they go straight to that. It never actually passes through text. Everybody keeps asking for, I want the actual text that Alexa heard. And it's like, it doesn't hear that. It hears noise. Okay, and it compares that to what the highest confidence is, or lots of money, on your speech model to give you, here's this invocation and here's the slots that I heard. Okay, Google did not take that route. Google have invested in as making their speech to text as high quality as possible. Okay, so they're putting, they're burning all of their energy on that. Okay, and once they have the text, they can go to any number of different places. Okay, and so they're, they bought in a API.ai as their sort of, oh, I've got, they, that was a chatbot type service. It's, once I got the chat text, it might as well be a chatbot, and they just kind of go from there. And they've all been putting their, you know, Google brains on the whole highest quality speech to text. Okay, which is, you know, normally I'm like, okay, well, that's, not as going to give you as good quality as you know really doing it to a constrained model, but if they put all their energy on that, they can make it a good quality, and if they got good fuzzy matching on the side, it can help equal out for them. Okay, but because of that, they have many other things they can now use that for. Okay, because of course they want to index the whole world. They now have a way of indexing anything anybody has said on broadcast TV and all of this sort of other stuff. So they've got a lot of other games they can play in that area. So it makes sense why they've gone in that direction. Okay, I'm not convinced it's going to give the most accurate results. I think that the Amazon direction is going to get a little more accurate, but they're also only going to be able to use that for something that has a constrained book that really like that. So there, it's interesting to see the difference in approaches, and we'll kind of see which one wins in the end. notification API. And the example you used was when you asked the question and it took some time and then came back later. Can it ever 
ask uh, to speak independent of you asking questions. So, for example, um, start screen outside, how to explain or something that just totally is synchronous, start speaking. And you also mentioned this thing of goes green and then you need to say a your message. Um, does Google have that restriction as well? Or um, so the short answer is no. The green line is as good as you get. <laughs> it's, uh, it, 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 it's a privacy thing. Because like one of the first skills I wrote was a UPS tracker. Okay, it's like oh well, of course I have the complexity of being able to recite a 14-digit alphanumeric code, which I just <laughs> had trouble with. But um, it um, there's an API for you know talking to UPS to say what's the state of my package, where is it, and you get all this information back. But that took longer than its time out. Okay. Because it has, when you talk to it, it only waits a little bit, it only waits, I think, eight seconds before it, if it doesn't hear something in eight seconds, or it takes you longer than eight seconds to reply, it drops along. It's like, I, I give up. And that's a big design constraint. Okay. But yeah, if it doesn't hear it, it goes off. There's no way for it to spontaneously wake up later. So there are tricks you could use. Like for that, for example, I would like, okay. I got the number, I'm going to now look it up. And I run that on a separate thread, and my other thread would be sitting there waiting for the other thread to commit. If it finished in time, it would say the result. If it didn't finish in time, it would say, oh, you know, hey, you know, I'm not quite sure about that yet, uh, but, you know, I'm probably okay now. Is that good with you? And you say yes, and it's your result, because that's, you know, the lady, you tell a joke, you know, or, you know, you do a little thing like, actually, it was name nerd that um, I did that in. Alexa, open name nerd. Welcome to Zaza Zoo Name Nerd. Say the name you would like me to look up information about or ask for today's name. For details, say help. Brian. As a boy's name, Brian was most popular in the year so 1977 it when it was ranked 32,498 children in the year Brian. It was first used in 1909 and is still used today. It is currently ranked 168. This name has been trending downward for 10 years. As a girl's name, Brian was most popular in the year 1972 when it was ranked 794th, 170. Um, it's, it's very thrilling when you, for Google, you can say, hey, Google, shut up. <laughs> but so Google actually was the first to show that sort of name, that sort of um, notification API ability. And I completely missed it when I saw the video demo with people on Slack. like, no, they're doing you know, the push notifications. I'm like, I didn't see any of that. It would go beep when the lights would flash. And they had that. They still haven't released that. Okay. But they demoed that when they first brought out the Google form. Okay. So I'm pretty sure that they're going to go in the same direction. Okay. As I said, there's a bunch of privacy concerns. And it really, you know, it really puts the, the, the dagger through the heart of a lot of ideas. Okay. And you're like, oh, is this? And it's like, no, you can't do that. Oh, but when they do it, I'm like, I don't think they're going to do it. You know, I, I just can't see how to make that, you know, not... It's like pop-up notifications or mobile device. Everybody hates that. They come up with the wrong app on all this crap coming up on your screen all the time. Nobody likes that. So I don't think they're going to go in that I may be wrong. A lot of people have written their own IoT devices specifically so they can get that. Because this is like a Bluetooth speaker as well. So they have some device, that has to go back to the device, and then sends it through this other Bluetooth speaker. Or their PC or something like that. But that's what you have to do because they're not there. I don't think they're going to go there. Other thoughts? No, I'm just focusing on you, putting you on the spot. <laughs> Anybody else thoughts, ideas? Oh, I have a question. Yes. <clears throat> um, could you um, pull up the, you know, the architecture that I've been doing? It's yes, just, uh, just for uh, any, uh, as a maker of hardware devices, uh, could you kind of maybe go through where in the architecture people would normally design hardware? Is it kind of and interface is it is it typically here and set by? Is this where you develop custom hardware to interface to <coughs> to the Alexa? Okay, on the hardware side, your hardware is going to be down here. Yeah. Okay, and your hardware doesn't have to interface with Alexa. Okay, because Alexa only talks to something. I'm not sure. 
there's a problem about talking about Alexa in front of us. Like, like live casts at home. And I was like, oh, I'm like, not oh, quite. Uh, <coughs> hardware is going to be down here. Yeah. Okay. Whatever device you have. And then you're going to have to be in the cloud to manage that connection. So you can have whatever you want to talk to this in whatever the most efficient way is possible. So when you're adding, okay, do I need a network interface on this? Is it going to use semaphore? Or am I going to blink my lights? Whatever way you have of making and bridging that communication is in your control. Okay. So your hardware device just has to be able to talk to your cloud service. And they have no say in that. Okay. They have to say here how it Alexa talks to your cloud service. Okay. So obviously these two have to work together. Really, this is the same sort of thing. Um, but you could, I guess, proxy this all the way down to there, but that's probably not necessarily what you want to do, although it would be an interesting solution. Um, but that stays up in there, and that's all software. Yeah, and this is down here. That makes sense. Is, that, is this interface too many? Can you read temperature or data well, back? Well, it's going to ask you, <laughs> what's your temperature? Yeah. And if you support that as a feature, yeah. you're going to have to get that information there somehow. Now, it's up to you how you manage this. Like I said, if you get a firewall, you know, this is going to be in somebody's home. There's going to be a firewall here, which makes it hard to do this. It's a lot easier to do this. Yeah. But you're going to want to be able to do this. So you have to work out how you manage it. For a home, like I said, for a personal skill, just put a hole in your firewall. You're done. You know, put a hole in the firewall, tell it your IP address. You're done. For a, a more uh, you know, commercial rollout, you've got to... You know, have something that manages that, that connection there, and because you're going to want to be able to have this initiate talking to this. Because again, you don't have those notifications. So even if this initiates something, you know, it can't it can't tell the Alexa to say something. Um, I have a, one more question. <clears throat> so um, so let's say you're you're you decide you're going to develop a commercial product, and there is a lot of problems. Like you said there are some issues in AWS. Um, that are related to AWS services. And uh, one question was, what are the typical things right now that you see that can go wrong with AWS and has gone wrong? And the next question, the, the second question, the last question I have is, um, in relation to onboarding new clients to your web service, <coughs> can the authentication piece be managed on your own web service and pushed into uh, AWS and manage and then manage from there. Okay, so let me do the second bit first. Okay, because that, that's easier to answer. And what could go wrong? <laughs> um, you have a number of choices when it comes to authentication. All they really care about is OAuth two. It has to be OAuth two compliant. And part of registering your site saying, "Here is my OAuth two provider." Okay, uh, a number of people who are custom skills use certain commercial ones, like, you know, use Facebook, okay, because they want to then talk to Facebook, and once they get you to authenticate with your Facebook account, they can talk to Facebook on your behalf, or uh, there's a lot of GitHub-related skills, because people who are playing with programming are very familiar with GitHub, and there's been at least six different ways to automate GitHub, but all do exactly the same thing, because everybody's exploring. Um, and they use their OAuth 2 type stuff, and if you have something where you're primarily in somebody else's domain, that's great, you can use that sort of thing. I more encourage you to, you know, do the hard work of working on how to set up your own authentication thing so you can manage your own users. It's harder and more of a pain in the neck, okay, and one of those things where things can go wrong. Um, but you then have control over your users. Like I said, keeping your user identity, if you want to go commercial, you're going to want to be able to market to them. And having that, you know, having them sign in with an identity that you can track their email address and their activity level is going to be important for you getting stats back and being able to reach out to them. So there are a number, of, I think Apache has a, a thing to do, add OAuth to, to uh, the Apache web server. That, that's, that would be the thing to do. And then you're just, you're just going to point them at your provider and it's good to know like that. So that, that's what I would say about the, the authentication. What can go wrong? Well, there, there's, there's lots of things that could go wrong. Some are in your control, some are not in your control. The most irritating thing is when Amazon have an outage, okay? Which they really don't like to admit, and but it does happen. And the problem is, like I said, you're on the front end of things. Uh, for custom skill, most of your discovery is through their app, and their entire way of surfacing things is based on your rating, the number of reviews you have, and the number, what's your average star rating, okay? <coughs> 
So, and they will never, ever, just fighting on crawling over broken glass on knees, take down a user rating. Okay, no matter how fabricated it is, no matter how incorrect it is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it can be an absolute killer when you have an app that has probably like knock knock. It's surprising that it is as popular as it is because early in its life, Amazon changed their recognition model and it the app failed. And I didn't notice for a week and a half. And I go back and I look and I've got 30 one-star reviews. I'm like, holy crap, what's happening? So I fixed it. Okay. But they, you know, and I, I spent four months trying to get them to change those because the reviews no longer were relevant. They were not providing good information to the user. But now they're never going to advertise it because the average rating is low. So that can be particularly frustrating. Okay. Um, another thing is they do not protect... Like I said, it's a very new area. They're not really in the whole people want to make money on this. So one of the things that they have that Google's na Google does not allow for name collision. Okay, I name my skill Six Swords. No one else can name it Six Swords on Google Home. On Alexa, anybody can name it that. Okay, you can use any name you want, and anybody else can use your name, something similar to your name, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now that you're invoking these things verbally, you can sort of hide, kind of hijack somebody else's trap. Or as has happened to somebody, I got one friend who's got a lot of copycat skills. There's this one guy out there, copies everything he does. Everything he's done is successful, he goes and copies. And, you know, he's like climbing the walls or whatever. And the trouble is, is when the other guy's skill goes bad and they go to complain about it, because there's a disconnect because you've used it audibly, you then go to search for it on the site, and you find his skills and give him negative reviews. But this other guy's work. So that is a frustrating thing. Um... <clears throat> Things that are in your control is when your stuff goes down, you have an outage. Okay, I've done that where I'm trying to juggle a bunch of skills in one server, and a piece of my server goes down and all my skills go into the wall. I mean, I don't necessarily notice, because when I deploy, I don't do the good thing of testing absolutely everything before it goes out there. And suddenly I'm like, oh, crap. Like, it's not working. And it's like, okay, deal with it, et cetera, et cetera, like that. So being very methodical, having a good set of, you know, uh, post-deployment tests is a good thing. It's a very hard environment to test in. I think that only gets worse when you sort of have hardware devices. You know, you're going to have to update software that's sitting on an embedded device here, software in here, software in here, and stuff like that. That's going to be a problem area that you really have to think about. Trying to do an A-B thing where you say, okay, well, here's my development instance of these. Okay, and here's my deployed instance of these. And coordinating that sort of promotion from test to production is another area that you want to think about. Okay, and it is critical for commercial stuff because you don't want any outages. I sometimes sit there and like, oh, I got a new patch. But like I said, I had that guy that was playing Six Swords for six hours a day. And I'm going there and it's like, oh, PK Levy's on again. And I don't want to bounce the server because he's in the middle of something. Refresh. He's still playing it. Go off, come back an hour later, and he's still playing it. <laughs> you know, having a good, you know, I now have an A side and a B side. And I can, like, switch from one to the other and then update this one and then switch them back. All that sort of lovely platform as a service stuff can come into it there. You add in hardware, that's going to be another level of complexity that you have to kind of try to think through because software engineers, we always write bugs. There's going to be bugs there. You need you need a strategy for fixing. Yeah. Um, those are kind of the big things. Certification is a pain in the neck, but once you're past it, you're past it. Okay, and you can also tweak a lot of other stuff without having to go through it again. So that's that's not a, a long-term problem. It's, it's more of a sort of, I want to get there so. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. I guess this is more kind of a commercial question than a technical, but... Uh, well, no, it, it's kind of, say, if you've got, like, I'll just give a light bulb as an example, and you say, dim the light bulb, but you've got a light bulb that isn't dimmable, but you have to say, and um, we have this other product available and it will search Amazon for it and allow you to purchase it. Because they do that with the Amazon Music. If you search for a track that's not in their library, it says, PS, you can pay unlimited $7.99 a month or whatever it is. Uh, so is there a way to kind of do kind of add-on sales from whatever your product is? It's not a level playing field. <laughs> Amazon always keep the advantage there. So, um, no, but even using their service. Well, the, the answer is neither yes nor no, okay, in the sense that if you have a custom skill, there's nothing to prevent you from doing that, okay? 
you can, and again, you know, on, on the simple level of things, if it's a home skill, you advertise if you're dimmable or not. I have a percentage of or something like that. Um, if you're a custom skill, you, know, you might have that, or some you might want to leave that there for some of your future. If you got a home skill, you can't control what's sent back to the user. So you just say, I don't have this, the user can't do it. Okay. For the custom skill, you can sort of have it in there, and they can, they, you can hear them ask for it, and you can choose, they give a different response. And you can choose to say whatever you want. Okay. Amazon, Google forbids you advertising, but I think they're okay with you advertising your own stuff. Okay. I think that's what we went through with them on that. Uh, Amazon don't want you playing ads, but again, if it's your own stuff, I think they're okay with it. Okay. The difficulty comes in transitioning them to the marketplace. Because although you have a companion app and you can put text up in the companion app, you can't put a link in it. You don't need to do yeah, There's too many scary things you can put in your HTML. I was thinking more the way that you can already purchase stuff from Amazon. So it's like fulfilling their marketplace, their ideal, oh, purchase true us. So they are getting an extra, you, you mm -hmm. need to be on the Amazon marketplace to actually sell the product. So they're getting a cook somewhere down the road anyway. They don't have something like that, but there may be a transfer of that. I like one or two provider that they have is login with Amazon. Okay, like we're always looking for ways to monetize our stuff because, you know, we, we want to get more out of it than they're just the, the fun money you get for the games. Okay, so a lot of our stuff uses the login with Amazon. We, we said, okay, the user has to authenticate with Amazon to use our skill using login with Amazon, which you can use from a skill and you can use from a website. So now we have a way to have a website and a skill that uses the same authentication. We can forward that connection between the two. Then there's um, buy with Amazon because it's, it's like PayPal. It's a, it's a purchase thing where you can take money from the user or something like that. Okay. So between the two of those, we mostly looked at virtual goods, but you could sell physical goods that way as well. Uh, you can request one of the things when you create a custom skill. You can say, you know, I want the user's uh, find location, which is their address, okay? And they have to consent to that, but then you have that. So you could use the two of them together to do sort of some sort of electronic purchasing thing. Okay? It's not integrated with their marketplace. It'd be lovely if it was. Okay, there's there's just some really cool things we can do there. But as I said, what I think their focus is to sell more things in the marketplace. I think that is a direction they could go in. Okay, so obviously technically feasible. The question is, do they think that's going to work with their product line? <coughs> if that's their incentive, I think they should go in that direction. I, I think they might, because again, everything you sell in the market is taking that cut. So it's not there now. If you really want to do it, you can do it yourself now, but you're going to have to do all the work. Hopefully, it's, it's one of the features I think is more likely to come in the future. So that's why they won't tell you what their roadmap is, but when I look at ideas and look at them and think like, the notification API, I don't think we're going to get anything more than the green line. But that, I think there's a better chance that they're actually going to get something. Anybody got any cool project ideas on your ship? Or say, sir. Quick question on the network architecture. Yep. That's an IoT type app where you have a kitchen device to speak to. But if you don't have a kitchen light, you just want to respond, you don't have access to the firewall. No, you don't have to go to it. You never appear. And that's how, that's how the custom skills work, because they're not tied to anything else. And then again, you want to fake a device, okay, or some sort of thing, as long as it pretends to be a temperature gauge or a door lock or a light switch or something. You can do that. You don't need to go through it any harder, because they can say, oh, I discover my devices, you can just have them. I think it's kind of an interesting way to do some sort of like game, you know, tennis, or any the games, some of the games, like this, the games like that. But they're a way to interface with a virtual thing, or training. All right, Joe, does that uh, just come back more onto what you were talking about, about custom, uh, about the custom architecture? Um, how does this architecture change, or does it change if you pick the customs? Is this custom skill? Oh, uh, custom skills. Does well, it change? From their point of view, you get a different interface between their Alexa service and your web app. Instead of having this very sort of clear, um, I want to know discovery, tell me what devices are there, oh, what's the state of these devices, what features do you have? Instead of that API, you get a very different one, which is like, hello, the user said something. You, know, you give it your audio model, because it has to recognize all of that and say, oh, the user just invoked this command with these arguments. 
and you get a JSON blob. You, you know, these are all JSON web services. So it talks to you, says, "Oh, the user invoked this command with these services, with, the, with these arguments," and you have to give back what to tell the user. Okay, you, that's pretty much what you can respond with. Say, "Oh, say this on the device, print this on the card, uh, end the conversation, or don't end the, or listen for more." Okay, is really kind of what it mostly boils down to. So, so it becomes a very uh, sophisticated text-to-speech API. It is. You can never get the actual text of what they said, but yeah. it has to conform to your audio model. Yeah. But yes, that's kind of. And then you can, you know, again, you're still going to have all these pieces if you're managing devices, because yeah. you got to do this somehow. Yeah. But it's just, this is all that changes. Is just exactly how they talk back and forth. So essentially, you can push JSON this way, and then audio comes out. Yes. On the device. Yes. And, uh, so, I mean, it's just what you do, you, you go back a JSON blob and it has a bunch of stuff in it, but primarily there's you know, what to say. Yeah. And again, you have this extra thing is if you say something and then you don't say anything for a while, you can optionally have a reprompt. So, you have what to say, what to say if they don't say anything, uh, whether to end a conversation now. As you see, it's like when I'm in dialogue mode, it just sits there and it keeps talking. And then sometimes it's like if it would like for demotivate, it said something and then stopped. Okay, so you can control whether to listen for more or to stop. Um, you can say what to print on the card. Uh, you can say what image to put on the card. Uh, for the newer ones, for the show, you can get it to play uh, a video on these sort of things. You can get it to play audio as well, and that continues on in the background after the skill is done. But you lose control at that point. You just place the audio. The more control you give yourself, you obviously going down to custom uh, skills gives you more control. You can do a lot more stuff. But does the certification then become a lot more difficult then? Because uh, AWS or Amazon no longer have control about what you're doing. Right? Yeah, it does become more difficult. I mean, since they have their guidelines, it's like one of the things that's like one of the painful parts of it is like, oh, whenever it says something and leaves the opening listening, you have to end with a question. Okay? What do you want to do now? It took a lot of effort to persuade them that if I've got somebody sitting in front of this for six hours, they don't want to hear what do you want to do now hundreds of thousands of hundreds of thousands of times and that so and you know you could sometimes negotiate with them over certain things but there's stuff like that they want to make sure that every function you've declared as servicing that you actually does something it said repeat something relevant i've got that a lot where it says the response was not relevant to what i said yet okay and sometimes what they said made no sense and they love doing things out of order <laughs> like you know <laughs> alexa you know blah 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 and then you know they just say one of the other commands completely out, making no sense, and you have to you have to come back with something that was. But they will test your whole audio model. You know, they're very um, they're very pedantic. Okay, in the sense they look at all, they have their steps, they go through all of those steps. So if you've one little thing out, they'll often find it. But sometimes if you fulfill the letter of it, as opposed to spirit of it, they're okay because they're pedantic. Those bones. Okay. Thanks. Go. Cool. Joseph, complex. Let's say or custom skill, is that giving you phonemes or words or how the JSON skill? When you define your audio model, you kind of say, okay, first you look at it abstract. Here are the functional things that I expect you to be able to do. For results six sorts briefly, there's like, oh well, move. I want to move, uh, I want to check my inventory, I want to attack a creature like that. Then you have to map those <coughs> intents to actual ways you can say that. So all the different ways you could say that get mapped to that one function. Okay? If there's like an argument to that function, it's like, oh, well, um, activate Caroline or something like that. You can put like a little spacer in your sort of things there and say that there's something to be captured of the text for that. And you'll get that little bit of text there. Okay, that is an argument to that sort of invocation space like that. But that's how you build up your audio model. From that you can do like a big tree out to work out take the phonemes, work out what the phonemes for them say are, and do a best case match, and work out the highest competence level. They do not tell you the competence level of what they match. You might want some speech to text. It's a much better job. Uh, but from that then, it says, ultimately what you get is, this function of yours was invoked. And if it has you know, slots or parameters, here's the text that went into those parameters. So essentially, you submit your vocabulary, your sentences, the cloud. Yes. They process it, build some sort of a model. Yes. They do whatever, Gaussian things in the voice and give you it's with the most probability <coughs> this is what we can say. That's mm -hmm. a sort of a vocabulary text. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's fine.
I will be brief, so I can see if you can follow her. Uh, what I want to say is that you IoT, there are business models out there. We have several friends who are in the business of home automation. We do these company businesses for very, very wealthy high-end people. They are looking for home automation solutions. Suites of things that, that network together um, different components to make their lives easier so that they can put more systems in. It's a way to simplify their work, and this is a huge growth industry. I can't remember what the figures are right now, but if you have an idea that goes along those lines, and it makes them very happy, very happy, I would strongly suggest you consider moving forward and experiment and test and try it out on your friends. And really, you could wrap up the, the code and deliver it separately uh, apart from Amazon so just to, to deploy as a, as a private as a private scale. So, just put in that that, that's actually one of the sweet spots <coughs> where you can have a commercial personal skill. Okay, where it's like one of the people we worked with is um does these sort of smart houses for people for you know, wealthy people. So you make a lot of money off of a tiny amount of people. Small market, lots of money, big market, small money. It's a choice that people together these smart homes and they want to say it's like, oh, is it, it, the wine cooler the right temperature? It's the wine for the better. But um Things like that. So that's so sometimes we get these sort of somebody wants to do something crazy and they're like, oh, we need a hardware person <laughs> and stuff like that. So that's another market thing about that. Stuff. Questions? Yes. And um, I just have one question on the network architecture. Yeah, here. Um, you mentioned on the tap, and it's a kind of like a remote kind of device as well. I assume you, the Amazon Echo, if it's talking to the kitchen lights, it all needs to be the same internal Wi Fi network. No, no, there's, no. No, there's, no connect there's no connection between the Echo and your device. You think there would be. Okay, and a lot of people make that assumption, but that would be going like from here to here. Okay, but everything it talks to goes up into the cloud, and it requires that it comes back down here like this. Okay, um, they don't allow this, and again, I think privacy is the big concern there. Okay, but it doesn't. You know, initially, when I started, you know, when I did the outline, I thought they did that because I think they might have at the beginning, but as of now, they don't. They don't do that. There's no direct communication, so it's around like this. When I was setting up these devices here, I'm like, oh, okay, I need this Echo, and then I started setting it up, and it's like. Wait, that's my home network. It's like, oh, that's my Echo, Echo back in the U.S. <laughs> that you know, I can sit it there and play with that because these are all, as far as Amazon is concerned, everything's in the cloud and you got endpoints that connect. So you can talk to your kitchen light at home from here. Yeah. And if you can talk to your kitchen light at home from here, and if you can talk to multiple other networks, say your office, boss from your office, here, your hotel room, or whatever, and turn off all the lights in those multiple different locations. Yeah. You know, it's just, again, it's, it's an inconvenience, but it could be an opportunity. Okay, I think once we are talking about this concept of cloud based processing, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on the latest as you go to here and how does it correspond to the user experience and sort of the reaction time of for, for an average application? No, that, 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 that's a good thing, because that's one of my personal bugbears, is you might see up here they talk about AEWS, Lambda, Skill Adapter, that's because um, I stole this slide from them, or this, this graphic from them. <coughs> um, you just need to put up a webhook, okay? That most of the time, that's what they want to do. They, they, they really have two options. You can call a Lambda service, a Lambda function, which is their microservices, serverless, sort of thing like that. Usually it's a little Node.js app that they can put up there, but it can also be in Python or Java. I think they brought in C-Sharp, I can't remember, so I'm allergic to C-Sharp. But um, you have that service there like that, and you don't have to have to play server, et cetera, et cetera. But it can be a REST API as well, and you can run your own sort of thing like that. Now, I started off with Lambda because it was small, it was simple, it was cheap. Uh, they, they have a very generous free tier that lets you do lots of stuff. But I got hit by the latency, okay, because it's a microservice, you can't, put things on background threads. Uh, it, it's invoked, your app runs, and it goes away. So you can't cache anything either. Okay, so any, if you're doing a database lookup during that, 
that latency gets added to the user response time. Similarly, if you want to save stuff back to the back end, that also gets added to it like that. So you have to be conscious of it. Now, I didn't have a good experience. I was writing Java Lambda services, and they had the JVM has a higher startup time than Node.js. Okay, the people using Node.js, I, I was seeing sort of like, you know, 200 to 400 milliseconds to get my information from there, and then a similar sort of thing to write them back again. So I was kind of like adding seconds to it, which I was very, not, you know, and as I started wanting to do more database lookup stuff, I'm like, okay, this is not going to go, I'm going to be, the user's going to be waiting, and I don't want that user experience. Uh, so I switched to a web service where I can do the caching, I can do the lookup, I can keep stuff in there, I have much more control of it. People that have been using Node.js sort of said that, oh, well, actually, no, it's a dyna using their microservice with their database service, DynamoDB. They're seeing only like 20 milliseconds for connecting to the database and doing stuff like that. I think it would probably go up a little bit if it got more complicated. But it seems like in Node.js, uh, it's, it's a much smaller thing to start off. They're having a lot less latency issues then. But you do have to be aware that, yeah, whatever you do adds to the response time. So you do have to be conscious of it. You probably want to benchmark some stuff, do some worst case analysis to make sure that you're always giving the user experience you want to give to the services that you use. What's your experience with the actual quantification of that number? Is it like 50 milliseconds from when I say turn on the lights to when the lights come on, or is it 100 or 200 milliseconds? Um, I don't I don't actually have any enabled hardware devices in my phone. But in general, seeing my services and stuff like that. It's pretty good. I mean, what it does is you ask it a question, you see the light flash for a bit. It's usually less than a second or two. Okay. And that's till it has it up in number four. And then it's totally in your hands how it gets back down to the hardware device. <coughs> so, you know, usually within a second is, is a pretty reliable thing to get to you. And then it's up to you how you do it. And they do certain co-location. Like, you must deploy. They, they all operate out of the U.S. East 1 branch your mega pod in Amazon and they actually request you long you host all your stuff there. Plus you're in Germany and they have a, another pod that they use. They are also officially deployed to England and I can't remember if there's a, a specific pod you're supposed to use for that. But they try to keep the services close together to give the least latency that So you're saying that Alexa services are not the two geographic locations? Right now Alexa's in the US, it's in Germany and it's in uh, the UK. Okay. Ireland, I think, gets grandfathered into the UK as often as the case. Uh, I know, actually, you know, the guys I know in Ireland are mostly in Northern Ireland, so I can't tell you. But, um, and there's people in other countries that do use it, but they have to kind of practice, pretend to be in one of those things. I think, I think they're rolling it out in India. Either they just have or somebody said they're planning to. I suspect that will be an English language for another English language version rather than an actual Hindi. Very exciting if they do Hindi, but I'm not sure that the market there is, is big enough for that. Um, Google Home is in the two English geographies and has just released French <laughs> and German. Okay. And I actually expect Google because the approach they've taken to be much faster at releasing other languages. Okay, because they're doing this speech to text and then the text side is gonna be pretty much the same for everything. Okay. Uh, it's the speech recognition side they'll have to do uniquely for each language, but I think that's a smaller bar than Amazon having to do the full stack all the way down for each language. So we'll see. I mean, they've done to two many. I thought they were going to bang come out with like 12 at once, but they came out with two, so we'll see what rate they produce them at. Okay. Um, yeah. okay, well, well, thank you very much for letting me blather on. I, I hope that it's in at least somewhat interesting at home. Not everybody's hanging out here with a free raffle prize. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Uh, it's been a pleasure, Joe. Um, very, very informative and uh, uh, very, very interesting stuff. Uh, <clears throat> what I want to do is, uh, has everybody signed here? Because in here, because uh, we're just doing a raffle there. We have two ESP32 modules and a couple of Pringles. So I will destroy the paperwork when I finish it. I'm not really using it for any marketing stuff, just purely uh, just to do a raffle. So uh, while you're doing that, I'll just go quickly through the ESP32 just briefly there. Uh, just kind of give you uh, just a screen. Sure, please, please. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
So, like, I think last meetup we were talking about um, Kinesis streaming uh, and Kafka streaming, basically taking uh, taking data from uh, low-level devices and pushing small packets into Redshift on the AWS. And a question came up about uh, MQTT is a very lightweight version of sending data over, rather than using Kafka or Kinesis. You can use MQTT as, and it's probably the preferred choice for very lightweight data communication between embedded devices and uh, some kind of a back end. The, diff the, the disadvantage of MQTT is it doesn't provide a store and forward mechanism. So if you cannot, if you cut that link between the device that's sending the data, the embedded device, and the back end is supposed to receive it, you don't, you can't catch anything. So if you have subscribed to Kafka or, or Kinesis, and that link gets cut, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, let's say the, um, the link between the database and uh, the, Kafka, the broker gets cut, you can cache everything away, and then when that link gets reestablished, you can start sending in and all those messages flow into the back end. So there's a, there is a slight advantage in using Kinesis or Kafka over MQTT. Uh, so, okay. I'm just going to put numbers against the names. And I have an app I just downloaded here to pick random numbers. <laughs> so I have uh, two. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to uh, show you. Just I'm, going to do, I'm not going to take any longer than maybe two or three minutes just going through this uh, the ESP32. We were talking about the ESP3266 last week. Um, where is my. There it is there. Well, it has actually maximized on this screen instead of the other one, of course. I just uh, share this, duplicate the screens here. Uh, I, Hopefully it will show. Okay, it's uh, it's not the best, but okay. So basically, the the ESP32. I just came across this as a kind of an enhanced version of the three two uh, eight two six six. Does anyone ever hear this particular module? Uh, anyone ever come across this module? It's basically it's a very very low cost certified module that has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in it. ETLE, and uh, you can, it's it's about four or five dollars for the entire module. It has a microcontroller built into it, a dual core microcontroller, and it has, you can support up to 64 megabytes of flash, you can integrate it into the Arduino IDE very easily, or some kind of open source uh, GCC compiler. And basically, it is probably the, it's probably the lowest cost module I've ever seen that gives you everything you need to get your device on, you know, on the, um, your IoT device online, and like I said, it is only about four or five dollars. Um, uh, so I, I just don't know how they can make these things so cheap. You know, um, the reason why it was dual core is because uh, the ESP8266 had one core, and what was the problem was is when you had your your microcontroller and it was trying to talk to your Wi-Fi uh, devices, and your Bluetooth, it didn't have Bluetooth on it. The 8266 did not have Bluetooth. This one does have. But when you just tried, when you wanted to talk to the Wi-Fi controller, you had to put in a bunch of stops and uh, wait statements and all that kind of stuff. So it got quite messy. So they decided to put one core dedicated to the radio stuff and the second core for, for your code. So that's the reason for the dual core there. So, um, so that's it. So I just, um, I just, uh, I have two modules here. Joe, have you, have you any? Uh, how many books do you have for you to? Okay, so Joe has two sets two books. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to wrap it up um, these these two modules here. Uh, so I'm just going to put on my random number generator here, set it up to 13, 13 uh, numbers. So back, back. So one, two, 13. Done. Hit it. Okay, hold on. First number is one. So that's uh, Shane Lee. All right, you get the module. 